Einen wunderschönen guten Morgen wünsche ich euch. To also welcome you warmly from my side and as such a, a wonderful privilege to have this opportunity to be together and to enjoy this wonderful weather. sprach ich über ein sommerliches Thema. And we've been talking about Jesus and, and the way he's he was teaching, he was dealing with people and, and loving on people. And our, our topic that we've been talking about in this sermon series, it's just summer in Ecclesia, so it's kind of open for everything. But we've been talking a lot about Jesus and his life. But there's another thing that I've wanted to talk about is a little bit different. But, you know, despite how wonderful the weather is and, and the great things that God might be doing in our life or around us, sometimes it happens that despite all the things that we have shadows kind of that are, are on our spirit, maybe, maybe we're having bad weather during that day, or a storm or a dark, and the sun's not shining, and oh, we maybe sensitive to needing a lot of daylight, who knows? And, and it's just external things are, are weighing us down quite a bit. And it's, there is a statistic there, there are five million people here in Germany that fight depression. And it, there are so many people that have depression that they are actually calling it a, a very common uh, disease or problem among the people. The word depression it comes actually from Latin, and it means that you're pressed down. And, and this is a psychological, a, a mental sickness. And just as our bodies, our physical bodies can have a problem, also our soul can have a problem and, and be sick and need healing. And so maybe you would ask, oh, how do we recognize this, this problem? Well, Dr. Wikipedia describes the symptoms of a depression as being glum or having a, a, a tendency to, uh, to spend too much time brooding over things. Maybe you don't have a, a drive or motivation to do anything. You're just kind of hanging around and can't get yourself going. Um, a lot of times you have absolute no no feelings of pleasure, you can't be happy about anything. Or you have a, a low sense of self-esteem, you don't think uh, you're worth anything, and you're not interested in anything going around you in life. You don't have any feelings of, of pleasure or, or that anything's fun or, or happy. But I want to tell you something today. God made us, and he made us as a triune being. We are more than just our bodies. We have a soul and a spirit, and he loves us. He loves us in every part that he made. It says in 1 Thessalonians 6.23, May the God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see here these three aspects of, of a person that God made. And we see the spirit, we see the soul, and the body. And we want to see what, what God means by this. The spirit, of course, is supposed to be saved and made alive in a real sense of life and, and being alive spiritually like God intends. Our soul has to be restored so that it can be set free and not be bound by things. And our body needs to be in submission 
to what our spirit says. And when we talk about this complex of salvation of our spirit in Jesus, that he made us alive and that we are made uh, justified before God, this is called justification. This is a technical term in theology, justification. And it just means that you are in a state now because you believe in Jesus and what he did for you when he died on the cross that he gave you a right standing with God. And no matter how you feel or whatever, the fact that you trust in Jesus and he did this for you, you are okay with God. The price has been paid there is no more uh, punishment that God is going to give to you for not being in touch with him in communication, in communion with him. Because you are. Jesus made the way. But you know, despite it all, our spirit in our body, our soul, are not completely in sync. Sometimes they just get out of kilter and they aren't always in the likeness of Jesus, which they are supposed to be. That is our goal. And the process that the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives as we read the Bible, as we pray to God and, and spend time with him and, and think about the things that are pure and lovely, and true, like the Bible says, that as we meditate on these things, as we do what the Holy Spirit's telling us to do, obey God and, and do the works of the Father, um, we are being formed into the likeness of Jesus. But there's this, this thing about we are in God's eyes and spiritually and and technically and legally, we have already been bought, we are already his. But then we have that, when you look at it, you think, oh, well, we're not there yet. So this is this paradox kind of that it's, it's there and then also not yet. And this is ongoing process of, of becoming holy and like Jesus. This is called sanctification, another big theological word. But, you know, we've talked a little bit about the three parts of, of our personality, of our person. But today, we usually talk about the spiritual things when we come together here in church. But today we would like to talk about what's going on with the soul. And the soul of our person is, is something that can't be seen. And, and in the soul, this is the part also, not only the spirit, the spirit is, is eternal. And when we die, the spirit will continue and it will be with God if we chose Jesus, if we believe in Jesus. But our soul also keeps going on. We lose our body. You know, you hear these reports of people that have died temporarily and, and maybe they were being, they got CPR or whatever and came back later so they could tell us about it. But you know, they were standing above and they were trying to talk to the doctors and stuff and hey, uh, you know, hey, I'm up here, you know. And they're working on the body, <laughs> trying to get them to breathe again. <laughs> and, and, you know, so the soul keeps on too. I mean, you still have your, your same, you know, whether you're a, a quiet personality or really outgoing or whatever, you know, your, your soul also is eternal. But your body, well, it just stays behind. <laughs> but anyway, so God is trying to the Holy Spirit wants to consecrate us, wants to form us into the likeness of Jesus. And this is a process. And our soul is going to be in eternally by with God. 
Of course, the people that do not choose God, that do not want to believe in Jesus, for whatever reason, uh, they've made a decision. God gives them the the opportunity. The, he doesn't want people to be marionettes. He lets them choose. And if they don't want to choose in him, well, they've chosen not to be with God. And that's a very bad choice because that's hell. And, and there's a lot of torment there that we cannot imagine because just as you see terrible things going on in the world, uh, hell is worse than that. But you know, our soul also has the possibility to be uh, integrated with our body and our spirit. And so our, our body has the five senses, right? Being able to see, hear, smell, touch, taste. So we can smell something or see something and we say, ah, isn't that wonderful? Ah, oh, that rose smells so great. Ah, this hamburger, ah, oh, best hamburger ever, you know, whatever. But, you know, sometimes people also talk about other senses. Uh, sometimes the way we speak about things, we talk about a sense of balance that people have. Sometimes we talk about having a seventh sense. And actually, uh, this became uh, a terminology, a, a kind of idiom, because there was a TV show that was talking about the seventh sense. And it was actually trying to tell people how to drive the cars better <laughs> and, and, you know, how to kind of be more cautious and, and think maybe like the other people on the road and, and you know, whatever. And, and some, actually, this, this TV show is no longer uh, being aired, but but that's become kind of an idiom, you know, that that you kind of, oh, this person's kind of standing on the road. Be careful. They might decide to run after a ball or whatever and suddenly be in the road. And then I have to have sharp, sharply break. And, and so that's kind of the, the traffic sense or the seventh sense. But, you know, this this intuition that that this and this might happen. Um, sometimes we think women are a little bit better at that. Uh, maybe they're just more aware of things that are going on and guys are kind of one track line, who knows. Um, at any rate, but there's another sense that people have, and that's a sense of faith. And this is a sense that is built into our personality that that we can be sensitive to spiritual things that that we can be searching for and able to have a piece of faith that we can that we can take the risk according to to how other things kind of measure up and make sense in their own way and, and go over kind of a bridge of faith. Maybe, like to use the analogy, maybe maybe you're trying to go over a canyon or a ravine or something and, and there's a lot of fog and you can't see the other side. But you think that if somebody built this strong bridge, that it probably won't end just in, in nowhere and you won't see that it's dropping off into the bottom of the canyon. I mean, all things that you see and, and you put together in evaluating that seems to make sense in its, in its own system that, that this is going to be the right thing to do and it's going to be the way to get to the other side. And that's the sense of faith. And sometimes, you know, when you read the Bible, you think, oh, wow. But the more you read it, the more it makes sense. It's, it's within itself. And then the Holy Spirit gives us this faith, this seed, this grain of faith in our heart that this makes sense. Maybe not according to our mind, but according to our spirit, it makes sense. 
And you know, Moses experienced this. But he also had a, a thing of depression. I mean, imagine what Moses went with through leading this people of Israel. What were they, five million people through a desert? Have you ever thought of the logistics of how to, how to lead these people around in a desert? With all of their women and their children and their animals and everything. And you have to lead them and, and they got pretty tired of of eating what what God was giving them the heavenly food. That that was really unusual. And and they had very definite ways that they were supposed to do it. It would it would appear in the morning like to do on a like we would say do on the grass, but there probably wasn't any grass. But, but it would appear and then they'd have to gather up enough that that they would have enough to eat for the day. And if they gathered up too much it would be ruined, it would be spoiled on the next day. And then the next day there would be enough. There would be brand new manna. And And then there was the day of rest, and so for the day of rest, they had to gather a double amount of the day before. So, I mean, they were having to, you know, if they think, okay, we, we, we learned we can't do it this way, but then they had to learn that, that they had to do it a different way, so they had to really be flexible and not just be completely stuck in, okay, this is the only way to do it. So here they were, but they were getting tired of eating the same thing, even though it was a heavenly food and a perfect, perfect nutrition, obviously. But, you know, their taste buds wanted to taste something else, or they wanted to see something else, or whatever. And they started complaining to Moses. And they wanted to have melons, and they wanted to have meat, and, and all these things, vegetables, all these things that they had had in Egypt. And, and Moses got so tired of hearing these people complaining. And, and he said, where can I get meat for these people? They keep wailing to me, give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all these people by themselves. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you're going to treat me, God, just please go ahead and kill me. If I have found favor in your eyes, and do not let me face my own ruin. So these people were driving him crazy, and he didn't feel like he was going to be able to carry this burden. This is in uh, the book of Numbers, chapter 11, verses 13 to 15. And so even a man of faith that had worked miracles for God, with God, uh, even he gets down in the depths and, and says, I can't take it anymore. Just, just let me die. I've had it. He, even he goes through this, this sense of failure and weakness and physical weakness, but also psychological distress. His, his spirit was, was really beaten down. He, he was at the end of himself. And, and he had been through so much with God already. But you know what? God didn't answer that prayer. Not the way he said it on the surface. He answered a different way. He gave him a plan. He showed him how to how to organize, how to administrate these people, how, how, how to get a hold of things and, and how to do it better. And, and so God showed him that he needed seven, 70 elders to take out of the people and uh, that would, would help him fulfill these duties that he had. And, and so, you know, when we have a, a big job to do, a big vision to fulfill. You know, that's why I'm so happy that we have small groups here that that encourage uh, people that are, are there on the, on the grassroots to, to help take care of 
people. And, and you need people that are going to, to be there and help take care of people. Of course, the responsibility that Moses had it was so, so much greater. And, but he called into God. He knew he could call into God. But we can call into God and let us take care of each other. Let us be shepherds and, and mentors and, and come alongside to help each other and, and be God's hands and be God's heart among people. And you know, Joshua, the the understudy of Moses is his right hand man, the one who is has his uh, ruled after after Moses died. Joshua, who had been with Moses the whole time, when he was leading the people in chapter seven, it says Joshua. It says he came to this point too. He said, Lord. Alas, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. So he regretted crossing the Jordan and doing what the actual duty, the assignment, the, the vision, the goal that God had for his people. He he was so worn out from the from the thing and so discouraged by what he was experiencing that that he said, "Why did we ever do this? Why did we ever get started with this?" Then there was Elijah, the great prophet, and he knew how it was. I mean, he had battled all of these prophets of Baal, and he had called fire down on an altar that was drenched with water. And the fire consumed this this sacrifice on this altar. I mean, it was a miracle. And it proved to all of these other false prophets that God was the true God. The God of Elijah was the true God. Nobody could say anything against him. But Elijah, in the midst of all this, in the midst of all this, was facing the battle of his life because the king and the queen were evil and they wanted to take his life. They they had had it. And Elijah, after this great victory, he had to run for his life, literally. And he ran and he ran and he ran until he was so tired and he fell down and he, he went to sleep. He was just pooped. And in this point, he said, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom brush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then we have Joel. And Job was also in a very slim, bad situation, you know, that he was made very sick. He lost his children. His wife told him, just curse God and die. I mean, nobody was for him. He also came to the point where he said, I loathe my very life. Therefore, I will give thee free reign to my complaint and speak out in the bitterness of my soul. He didn't hold back. But, you know, God didn't hold it against him. And the prophet Jeremiah, he also, he was called the crying prophet, the, 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 the one that was crying all the time. And, and he had a, a very difficult assignment from God. And he was a, really a voice in the wilderness. Nobody listened to him. And they, they wanted to kill him all the time. And he said, alas, my mother, that you even gave me birth. A man with whom the whole land strives and contends. I have neither lent nor borrowed, yet everyone curses me. I mean, he was in the depths. And also we see 
King David in Psalm 31, he said, because of all my enemies and the utter contempt of my neighbors, I am an object of dread to my closest friends. Imagine that. And those who see me on the street flee from me. He, he says in Psalm 69.3, I am worn out from crying for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail, looking for my God. In another song of, of Korach, out of the clan of Korach, Psalm 42, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, from the heights of Hermon, from Mount Misa, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls, and the waves and breakers have swept over me. And then we come to the prophet Micah. He lost all joy on the things that he, he normally loved. And nothing was a pleasure to him anymore. And everything so meaningless, so blah. And what he said in chapter 7, what a misery is mine. I am like one who gathers summer fruit at the gleaning of the vineyard. There is no cluster of grapes to eat. None of the earthy figs that I crave. There's just nothing there. You know, there are a lot of these heroes, what we call heroes of the faith, and, and they went through these steps. They, they had victories, but sometimes also they didn't. They were just doing what, what God told them to do. They were obedient, and sometimes the way was so, so hard. And, and they were so, sometimes they lost all hope, sometimes they were so pressed down. But in the midst of all of this, Jesus talks to people that are in this state and he says, come to me, all you who are, are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. His favorite word is come, not go, go to this, try this. No, it's come. We have to come to Jesus himself in a, in a personal and a trusting relationship. And Jesus address this invitation to everyone who was, who was burned down, who was troubled, was really pushed down by circumstances and, and feelings of life. If, if you're burdened, Jesus says, come, come to me. I will help you. I will help you in your, in your need. Der Weg, den die Bibel uns aus einem Krankheitszustand aufzeigt, ist nicht lang. The way that the Bible describes is not long. It, it doesn't. Gehe zu deinem Gott. Ja, weltliche Ärzte können helfen. Of course, doctors can help. There's nothing wrong with doctors. I'm not going to say, oh, don't go to doctors. They're no good. They can't help you psychologically or, or with things that are burdening. No, that's not true. But also, also the doctors help. And, and if they prescribe medication, then please take it. If, if you're a Christian, but, but don't forget that if you're a Christian, then the first thing you need to do is to turn to Jesus. 
right? You don't go to the doctors and, and say, okay, well, I don't need Jesus anymore. Of course you need Jesus. And we come to Jesus and he says, come. And we do that. We go to Jesus. We pray to Jesus. We read the Bible. We, we look for what the Spirit's saying in our life. And God is able to not only heal the body, but also our spirit, our soul. And the question is, will God heal you after listening to this sermon? You know, God can do that. He can speak one word and it happens. We pray that this would happen in your life. Because healing, how he does it and when he does it, that's his business. But his thoughts, his ways are so much higher than ours. But we, our job is to meet him in faith, to to trust him, to have the faith, the sense of faith, to go over this bridge. We don't see. Maybe there's a lot of fog. Maybe we don't see what's going on. But that's our job, to listen to his voice and to trust him. He's got this. There are a lot of people that are going through similar things. You're not the only one. But you have a better than a lot of people because you know God. You have a God who is for you. And you have brothers and sisters in the Lord. You have a community of faith that are wanting to encourage you and help you, pray for you. And we want people, we want to help people and, and help bring them to Jesus so that they can truly experience his invitation to come and he will take our burden. He will give us rest. Rest sometimes in the middle of the storm. You know, he slept in a boat in such a storm that fishermen thought the boat was going to crash and go under. Fishermen were scared for their lives. And Jesus slept. He had rest. I would like to give a quote from Spurgeon. He was a preacher in the 19th century. He said, The Lord is able to conquer and withstand every need. His power is always enough to save us. And so we can have the faith, the courage to believe. It's a step of faith. We have to be brave. We have to look beyond ourselves in that in in that state of of being pressed down. It's it's hard to look beyond the circumstances, but God is just He is as close to us as as our breath. He gave us our breath. He gives us our very being, and we just have to say yes, Lord. Yes, I want to believe. Help me. That's all he wants. That's all he needs. Our willingness. You know, Lord, all of us are not perfect, not whole. Our soul is not complete and whole. And in some aspect, everyone, Lord, all of us have a problem someplace. And we ask you right now to to bring this into your perfect order, to bring it into 
to how you want us to be and to live in your freedom. Give us the, the fullness of your spirit, of life abundant, even in the midst of all of these storms, this perfect peace of the Holy Spirit. He'll help us to come out of this, this mire that we're in. And I pray for everyone that's right here or watching on live stream, everyone that's that's fighting depression. I I ask, Lord, heal these people. Everyone that are fighting depression, that we speak healing. Freedom is there for you in Jesus. And if you feel like you're just sucked up into this mire, into this swamp, Lord, pull them out. Pull them out of that. Out of that quicksand and set them, their feet on solid ground, on a rock, on the foundation that you've made through the prophets, through the scriptures, through the centuries, at the foundation of the world. Freedom. Freedom to serve you. Freedom to live for you, to hear your voice, to obey you. May that be present in our lives. That offer, that invitation is there for us every day. Are we Receive everything out of your gracious hand. And we give you all honor, Lord. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. I wish you God's richest blessings. And please, I'd like to encourage you, look at the small groups that we're having starting soon and, and sign up for one. Look at the homepage. 